This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. We have 49 minutes to crank out this podcast. <laughs> we're recording in a crunch because we're traveling tomorrow. We are recording in a crunch because we didn't do our homework. Oh, we did it. It's just we had less time than usual to do it. And so we're crunching. I am crunching crunch. on a Sunday. Crunch. Crunching. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. We're home. Temporarily. A day. 10 hours or something. Yeah. Um, we're waking up at 4 a.m. again to watch soccer. Maybe. No, I'm waking up. I'm doing it. No, I'm personal. committed. Now she's I'm I'm offended gonna, her. I really want to order an OL rain shirt t shirt. I really want Oh those. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's work on that. That's that's Pino and Rose Lavelle's team. I want I wanna I wanna I'm proud of you. Yeah, I'm learning things. Doing the Google. I'm learning things about soccer. Can either of us tell you what offsides is? No. Well, I still don't freaking understand this rule. Do we hate it I, normally? I, I like I I think I understand the concept in I football. Like, I understand I, offsides. Oh, football is very but, clear. But like soccer, in soccer is when like, it happens, I'm just like, wait, why? It's like abstract. There were three goals in a row that were denied, I think, yeah. in the game that we Two watched last Chris week. Two from Preston, one from Alex Morgan. Yeah, we're talking about Olympic soccer, by the way, in case for those of you who don't By follow. the time that this episode comes out, actually, hopefully that night, hopefully on the day the final. this drops into the earth. The gold medal game will be tonight. And, and hopefully the, US the United will be States in will it. hopefully be playing and they will win. Yes. Mark my word. Okay. Mark my words. It might they might be playing Sweden again. I don't know if I can handle that. Man. Anyways. Those Swedes. Um, that's our update. Yeah. That's what's happening in the world around us for the most part. It's the Olympics. Olympic soccer is the only thing happening in the world. As part us. of the Olympics have been fun. I haven't been as invested as normal, but I'm still enjoying them. Yeah, I haven't been invested as normal either. I, I think it's uh, just a weird vibe. We were talking about this. I it, think COVID it has vibe. made it a weird vibe. It's a year late. It's it just feels different and mm-hmm. weird. And I agree. Not it feels not as competitive for the United States for some reason. We talked about this. We become like, you know, we become super fans of the of our of our country. Yes, only during the yeah. Olympics. But also, the Olympics are kind of problematic like well they are problematic but also a lot of issues pop up i'm with. just very curious in years to come when people talk about this olympics if they're like oh these it wasn't what the olympics normally is because of covid yeah like i'm very curious i'm gonna see interested to see how they yeah. recast it but I, i'm also becoming way more aware of all kinds of problems the problems with, of them with the olympics that yeah. i just really didn't i was not aware okay. The one thing I will say about the Olympics, uh-huh. I don't know why I didn't think about this. I assumed that the IOC paid the winners oh, no, it's their a home set countries. amount. I just assumed that regardless of where you lived, you made X across the board for a gold. Interesting. No. It varies widely know, by country. Shame. Yeah. And it's not as much as I thought it would be. Not in the United States. These, yeah. A lot of these athletes get probably paid mostly by endorsement deals, which also aren't as much as you might think according to recent research yeah but they can't be they don't they don't get to rep endorsements at the olympics right right not at the olympics i just mean in terms of their professional athleticism probably the bulk of their money comes. oh yeah because like simone and biles and a few of those women are going to be doing the year after the olympics they always go around and tour Mm -hmm. and they do parts of their Mm -hmm. show you know whatever we just so they do um, make money we just obviously listened, on tickets yeah we just listened to uh, megan rapino's audio book to, well book on but it was her narrating it mm-hmm. and, and she was talking also about after these big international events it's it's all about a press tour and there's you know you can make money that way it's it's it's, it's important for it's them. very interesting and it gave me a new perspective on what well, athletes at that level because function. because she talks about she's like i'm an entertainer right <laughs> she she very firmly understands that professional athletes at least in this country you're in the entertainment industry okay but also the one we have to we have to move on but the last thing i do really want to say about this is her point and abby wambach also talked about this when she retired was that like in the case of megan rapino when they won their last fifa world cup right which is 
I, I, a lot of people would argue that's more important than winning an Olympic gold. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They had to come home, the women's team, and do a whole tour because that's how they make money. And yeah. it's like they make less per win. And so you think like, okay, Tom Brady wins a Super Bowl. He's not going to go on a tour, whatever, because he's made enough. He doesn't have to worry about it. They don't have it. to do the grueling press junk. No. Right. And like these poor women have to. Pay inequality is, uh, that's an ongoing Yeah. Issue. If you haven't read into the differences in what the men's national team and the women's national team make, you really should. And I. And the women are awesome, comparatively speaking. The men are well, not great. Well, they're like in the Olympics <laughs> and the men can't even work that one out. So anyways, here yeah. we are. On Here we my are. Soapbox. We've gotten we've gotten onto the professional soccer soapbox, and now we're going to this get off. Is now of it. professional soccer <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so I'm kind of angry. I need a drink. Oh, are you? Yeah, yeah. What are you drinking? Cold as the Rockies. Can okay. you can you taste the Rockies? I can taste the Rockies. It's Coors Light. All right, everyone. So this week, surprise. Yeah, this week. What are we talking about? You chose. Labor unions and education. I did. Well, unions. Yeah, teachers unions. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, Well, the only reason there's a caveat is because, as we're going to see, some people disagree about whether or not these unions are actually labor unions. The very first line of our notes. Uh Uh-huh. Second line is, this week we're talking about labor unions and education. So I was just... Yeah, yeah. I was just reading the notes. That's not meant to be a correction (laughs) for you. That's meant to be a commentary on what NEA thinks of itself. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Mm. yeah so teachers unions which is what we're going to call them even though one of them as we'll see kind of objects to that terminology teachers unions have played a pretty big part in the history and the politics of public education in america unless you're really directly involved in education you might not hear about them probably ever except for during presidential election cycles that seems to be the only time that (laughs) non-teaching people ever think about teachers unions is during presidential elections i would say that's normally true except for 2020 2021 teachers unions got a lot of press yeah covid made teachers unions yes have the media moment historically they're also when was that 2018 when the walkouts were happening teachers were chicago teachers were striking well it was all over the place but teachers were striking it was a lot in a lot of red states actually they were striking for a better working condition well chicago was one of the biggest yes that was one of the but it was like arizona north carolina arizona like those. well they, they also have horrible retirement systems yes. and everything else there so it was a like a red state strike but anyway other than that i think florida has as well yeah i think that it was in a couple of different yeah. red states okay. but anyway yep, i would say that during the normal During normal working hours of our country, people do not necessarily hear about teachers unions unless you're directly involved in the educational system. No. So, it's not an election year, and we're going to talk about them. How about that? Who knew? Who? Well, also, what we're going to be talking about, like, more specifically, are the two main teachers unions. Yeah. So, how these essentially work is, like, there's the NEA, which is the National Education Association, and then there's the AFT and the American Federation of Teachers. Mm -hmm. So, there are these two huge teachers unions, Uh right? The NEA and the AFT. Uh Uh-huh. There are millions of members of these things. Yes. Those are not the same as the unions that exist in your school. So you could be a member of your school union and not a member of one of these things. Well, it's kind of like a local affiliate, right? Most of them, yes. But I know people who do not have a union at their school who are NEA members. Does that make sense? You can be, you can, yes. Okay, I see what you're saying. You can participate in the overarching entity known as the NEA without what i'm trying to say though being is unionized. us talking about these two unions is not a reflection of local unions at schools because yeah. those are handled within themselves your school may or may not elect to as a school participate in one of these unions but you could individually play, pay dues is right. that what you're saying yes yeah yeah but i'm just saying when we talk about these things as like big groups i'm not talking about like columbus public's teachers union right specifically because they have their own they're they're basically kind of like chapters i guess i would say local local chapters of these large unions and and a school district may or may not be on the whole unionized meaning everyone basically (laughs) participates kind of more or less whether or not you want to like it's that kind of thing so you may or that's what i was trying to say right 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 is that these two things are huge yeah and when you talk 
like at the end when we'll talk about how teachers unions kind of started taking some flack during covid it was more specifically a a actual districts union Mm -hmm. who was taking the heat Mm -hmm. not so that makes sense right so it's like a group within a group sure yep okay yeah you want me to start yeah why don't you kick us off let's start with the nea the NEA. So the NEA is the largest labor union. It's the largest white collar rep in the United States, like group. And it also uh, represents public school teachers and other support personnel within schools. So faculty and staffers at colleges and universities, retired educators, college students preparing to become teachers. Interesting. So all of these people could choose to. So people like maybe going into education, but not yep. there yet are also. Or people who've already left education mm-hmm. or yeah. So this, um, this is like the catch-all union. <laughs> yes, it Everyone truly is a big tangentially umbrella. Tangentially related to education yeah. gets to go into the NEA. Right. Okay. So the NEA has just under three million members, and it is located and headquartered in Washington D.C. I shouldn't say located; it's headquartered in Washington D.C. Isn't this the one that was chartered by Congress? Uh, yes. Interesting. We'll get there. The history. But um, yeah. go ahead. So the NEA has a budget of more than three hundred and forty-one million dollars, and that was in 2012, 2013. So I'm gonna guess it's probably at least that still. Wow. But and this is true for three, how much? Three hundred forty-one million, million for 2012, 2013. Okay. But NEA membership has been dropping every year, so mm-hmm. keep that in mind. Okay. So the NEA was originally on the conservative side of U.S. politics, but by the 70s it emerged as a factor in modern American liberalism. So while they have stated that they are in a position of nonpartisan they almost only support democrats this is really interesting to me <laughs> because the, we're going to talk about this but a long-standing rift between the nea and the aft is over whether or not yeah. we are considered a labor union or a professional organization basically mm-hmm. professional organization is what the nea members have historically considered themselves as you're pointing out they started out with more conservative leanings and they're like we're not a labor union we're friendlier than that <laughs> organizing without teeth basically mm-hmm. but as you mentioned here at a certain point you have to at least the leadership of the organization <laughs> kind of came to the realization that like okay but it's actually working against our own best interest to support conservative politics in america because they are anti labor and anti-union in a lot of cases i don't mean to grossly generalize but i'm just gonna go ahead and do it so it is interesting to me that that shift occurred but also that i would say probably a lot of members are still on the side of yeah we're a professional organization not a labor union and i'm not necessarily pro the politics of the leadership of this organization yep Yeah. Uh, So at the national level, the NEA lobbies, the U.S. Congress and federal agencies, and it's always active in the nominating process for Democratic candidates. So from 1989 through the 2014 election cycle, the NEA had spent over 92 million on political campaign contributions, and 97 percent of that went to the Democrats. Wow. So the NEA now has a membership of just under 2.3 million people, and it's like I said, its membership levels have dropped every year since 2010. Yeah, I think labor unions in general in this country are seeing falling members. I I think some of that has to do with it's politics is very complicated in this country, but I would say specifically that even when I was doing research for this episode, I learned a whole bunch about labor and organizing. And I'm just like, how do we not talk about this stuff in in right. school, in history classes? I think okay, we're gonna actually it's gonna be our question of the week. We're gonna talk about this a little bit, but the Carnegie like the homestead strikes, I was reading about it, the Carnegie Steel and the, those kinds of things like I think I vaguely remember maybe learning about the steel worker strikes maybe once at some point yeah. in history class. But in terms of just like how this country's economy functions and the kind of balances between labor and regulation and government and workers and industry leaders, we don't really, I don't think we really give that subject mm-hmm. its due. Like I just, I learned a whole lot, I guess is what I will say that I feel like I should have known before now. Yeah. <laughs> we were researching this so true true anyway why don't you go ahead um so historically speaking it was originally founded in philly in 1857 and it was called the nta the national teachers association Hmm. it was historically thought of then and now i guess this is what you were just talking about rather that it was thought of more as like a professional organization than a labor union so this is they're not doing the nitty-gritty uh worker organizing and it's as we talk about the AFT, we'll talk about this. But I get the sense that the NEA has historically considered itself more a white-collar professional organization. Mm-hmm. And the AFT has been like, we're in the trenches. We're the blue-collar right. 
meat and potatoes yeah. of labor in schools in this country anyway right yeah mm-hmm. so the nta became the nea in 1870 when it merged with the american normal school association the national association of school superintendents and the central college association and that was a union that was chartered by congress in 1906 hmm. which would never happen now yeah that i put a note in there i'm like <laughs> can you that. imagine no. congress chartering Absolutely a labor not. organization now so the nea officially merged with the american teachers association the historically black teachers association founded as the national association of teachers and colored schools in 1966 so we had a big group that was chartered by congress in 1906 and then 60 years later we saw them merge with the historically black group as well interesting and so just a few things that i found that the nea has supported since their creation they endorsed women's suffrage they supported pension plans for teachers they helped to get special funding for public schools near military bases during world war ii they helped <laughs> lobby to pass the civil rights act um they lobbied for the passage of the bilingual education act they endorsed jimmy carter for president who then created the department of ed in 1979 um they were not big fans of no child left behind and they lobbied for changes within yeah. nclb i remember before the teacher strikes in 2018 that was the last major push that i remember actually hearing about teachers unions yeah. in the news was for no child left behind right yeah and then just kind of historically speaking they have or at least as far back as i could research and whenever they started talking about it i suppose they have been uh pro lgbt and anti-guns which i want teachers associations to be anti-guns i think after columbine it would be virtually impossible for a teacher's union to be yeah not outspoken about the issue of guns yeah um, that's just kind of what the nea has been doing uh with their with their money as far as supporting causes and things like that Mm -hmm. but they also like and this is true for a lot of teachers unions as they were as they were starting they've always been very pro in the case of what teachers used to be paid right in like the 1800s you got like a room and meals and things like that and so groups like the nea also really supported women getting into the profession and black people being able like they've been on that side it Mm -hmm. seems historically Mm -hmm. speaking so i i think i don't i can't speak for the whole of the nea but it seems like they have they have supported people who want to become teachers to let you know what i mean like they've always been on the right side of those things i guess is mm-hmm. what i want to say so mm-hmm. but that was reassuring yeah <laughs> uh, you never know when you start doing this research like uh, well, <laughs> how old are we talking about here? uncover things that you didn't are things want to bad know? Yeah, yeah so i was that made me feel good to at least read as a teacher because those are things that i support anyways you want to take the next one yeah this is the other big one so okay yeah. so you said nea the membership is what around three million um it's no 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 it's um what was it under 2.3 million under 2.3 million sorry yes. just 2.3 million that was the most recent figure though but some people are guessing that post-covid they'll rebound yeah i'll bet because people are start- teachers are really like <laughs> Hey, wait a minute. Can you help me? <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I do want to say, though, and this is probably the case in a lot of jobs as well, you don't need a union until you need a union, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and by then it's too late. Yep. So, anyways, go ahead with the So, AFT. yeah, the American Federation of Teachers, this is the other major teachers union or organization or whatever it is they want to call themselves. They would call themselves a union. Uh, they anyway, would. so they're, they're around, I think, 1.6 million members mm-hmm. in 2017 was the last figure that we had here. So they're big, not quite as big as the NEA, but big. They're the second largest teachers. These are still union, huge groups. Obviously. I mean. Yep. Yep. So about 60% of the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, again, the AFT's membership uh, works directly in education with the remainder of the union's members being paraprofessionals, school-related personnel, local, state, federal employees, higher education faculty and staff, even nurses and other healthcare professionals who are adjacent to school and school environments. So they're kind of a blanket labor organization. Um, I think this was maybe in contrast to the NEA, which started out as really kind of focused more on teachers rather than all Mm. of the staff that make up a school district anyway so they were founded in chicago on april 15th in 1916 they're a little bit younger as well then too a little bit 1916 yeah on may 9th in 1916 the american federation of labor the afl which became the afl merged with the cio chartered the aft by 1919 the AFT had 100 local affiliates and a membership of approximately 11,000 teachers, which was at that time 1.5% oh of gosh, the nation's teaching huge. force. In the early days, the AFT distinguished itself from the NEA, as we have mentioned, by its exclusion of school administrators from membership, which I think is fascinating. You and I were talking about this I before the episode. I think it's fascinating. You are nice. Yeah. You were like, you know what? 
uh, I think administrators deserve representation too in terms of labor organization. I was like, yeah, well, you're probably right about that. But also, if I were a teacher, well, I wouldn't want my boss. Okay, but what I did say about that, <laughs> hold on, those yeah. are not the same things exactly. What I did say is that, do I think they deserve representation? Yes. Do I think at a local level, at a district level, should we have the same union? That's no. the problem for me. Is it? How, I don't how, think they should. Because because often, unfortunately, it is the case that school administration and school teachers tend to be on opposite sides well, of okay, certain but issues. What I just said supports that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my point is, is I think at this level, uh-huh. if we're talking about a, a membership this size, yes, I think we should all be part of the... Like, I think the table should have everyone. Yeah, but the problem is, like, what if your whole district is represented by the AFT and you have admins and teachers and they're both appealing to the same local leadership? Well, okay. I, I don't mean to What, what say it's I have easy. seen in schools, uh-huh. though, is that previously I have seen the literal teachers, right? They are in their, they, they have their own set of the union. And then, like, janitors and things like that had a different group. Mm-hmm. So like they were sectioned off. So like staff might have their own people. Yeah, admin but that's might how have I've their seen own it. That people. doesn't mean that's how it is everywhere. Yeah, I, I just just to explain my my issue would be with okay, let's say that you have a dispute arising from labor related conditions in a school. Often, what will happen is, unfortunately, for example, teachers will be pitted against the administration to resolve a particular issue. And my, my thing was just like, I, I, I can understand that. why you wouldn't want the same labor organization representing both sides of that particular debate. So I un- all I meant to say was that I understand why the AFT might have limited their membership to basically you can't be an admin <laughs> because it's just like the people you're supporting yeah. fundamentally are going to be I just, opposed I to one another on issues. I don't know if education gets better by pitting us against each other yeah. the whole way up. Yeah. That's my thing. For sure. I And I don't know how you could have an education association without the voice of all of the people yeah. who make a school go. So yeah. anyways. No, okay. I totally understand that. That makes a lot of sense. I, I just think it's it would be very difficult to sort out some issues. That's all. In, insofar as, it, as one of these unions might represent everyone, I think it would be very difficult for these unions to internally deal with conflicts between uh, sure. staff and administrators teaching yeah. staff and administrators like i, I said i i have i have never seen in a school union where that has been the case yeah doesn't mean it can't be yeah but i have not personally seen it yeah anyway okay so back to this the aft they initially excluded school admins from membership and then eventually facing opposition from politicians and boards of education they their membership declined to like about seven thousand in 1930 and this is for a lot of reasons but anyway the during this period I that mean, the org yeah. didn't have very much impact on local or national education policy so the membership climbed again during the great depression it reached <laughs> about 33,000 by 1939 the during, big jump yeah, 10 years yeah jeez during the 30s the AFT the, the members had historically been primary school teachers which i think is interesting they saw influential college professors start to join hmm. the union also, during the 30s, the Communist Party gained influence within the AFT. So this is how we get to the left-leaning sympathies that we have currently in this particular labor organization. But there's all kinds of interesting stuff that happens. In 41, under pressure from the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, the union ejected three local unions in New York City and Philadelphia, including its prominent early member of the New York City Teachers Union, AFT Local 5, for being communist-dominated. <laughs> We're getting into like I mean, we're talking red scare territory. That's like the yeah. That's like leading right into we're, the height. We're getting of it. into there. I mean, parts of World War Two are already happening in thirty forty one. Sure. So I mean, yep. It's not surprising. There's a lot going on. Think of the propaganda. I mean, jeez. Labor and communism yeah, have a bad. long history in this country. Go out and grow a garden. <laughs> that's what they want you to do instead. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. No, no. We love a victory garden. A victory garden. <laughs> you know what I'd grow in a victory <sighs> garden? Pumpkins. <laughs> Very lucrative victory garden. I don't know. I don't gourds. know. Would you grow in a victory <laughs> garden? Decorative gourds. <laughs> My victory garden is full of decorative gourds. Prize winning decorative gourds. <laughs> Prize winning. It'd be one of those flowers that only blooms like every 10 years or something. Oh, golly. <laughs> victory ahead, every 10 sorry. years okay yeah, yeah yeah sorry uh, it's just in my head it's a wonderful thing 
<laughs> so the 1940s were marked by a series of teacher strikes. There were 57 strikes that occurred mm-hmm. from 46 to 49. By 47, the AFT had a membership of 42,000. So still so, growing. Yep, still growing. The 1960s and 70s also saw a bunch of teacher strikes. There were about 1,000 of them involving more than 823,000 teachers between 60 and 74. Oh my gosh, it grew in 30 years. It got a lot bigger. Almost 800,000. A lot bigger. Wow. Uh, So AFT membership, well, they're they're not all union members, but these were participants in the strikes. Uh, so the AFT membership was 59,000. Yeah, yeah. It was 59,000 in 1960, 200,000 in 1970, and 550,000 in 1980. By 2017, the membership was around <laughs> 1.6 million. The union has a dues income of about 35 million. Yeah. So they don't have quite the money that the Not NEA has. quite. No, the NEA is bigger and more well-funded for sure. Yeah. Since 1977, the AFT has published a quarterly magazine for teachers covering various issues about children and education called american educator in 1998 the membership of the nea rejected a proposed merger with aft aft's membership is significantly lower than the nea's Mm -hmm. but they're both fairly large organizations we'll talk about that too yeah this this merger they don't just combine (laughs) the merger proposal was a surprise flop and it is very interesting we've hinted at it already so yeah anyway we'll talk about it yeah 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 so i want to talk about the politics of these yeah so since 1980 the two of them combined the aft and the nea have contributed nearly 57.4 million to federal campaigns an amount that's about 30 percent higher than any single corporation or other union um, that any single corporation thing is kind of mind that my that blows my mind yeah 30 percent higher than any single corporation yeah so i mean when you think of corporations like apple and alphabet and yeah. like some of these enormous tech firms and not again, even these figures much. might be a little bit out of date now i guess but yeah but when you think about that that's just woof they have incredible mm-hmm. influence on politics in this country so i was actually going to mention earlier when we were doing research for this i searched for just history of teachers unions in the united states and the first five pages of google results were just all right leaning think tanks bashing teachers unions it was, it was very was hard to find so eye-opening yeah. i'm like okay can i just find i just want some facts about the history of these entities like can we do that without right. getting a smear campaign article popping up but apparently nope. we cannot it we was cannot. very fascinating google is overwhelmed. it was really interesting <laughs> um Okay, so about, of yeah. those two, about 95% of political donations from teachers' unions, that includes the NEA and the AFT, have gone to Democrats. That's why I got all of the Cato Institute articles <laughs> on my Google results. Right. Because uh, they donated so much to Democrats. Okay. So in 2008, for example, the AFT provided a campaign contribution of over $1.7 to Hillary Clinton and just under $2 million to Barack Obama. So Wow. We're looking at almost, what, $4 million alone just to those two. Uh, And then in July of 2015, this is kind of where things got interesting, I guess, politically for them. They, the AFT endorsed Hillary Clinton in the 2016 presidential election. Yeah, that actually did surprise me a bit. And it's, a lot of people guess it's because uh, Clinton and the AFT president, Randy Weingarten, had been longtime friends. But AFT's official endorsement of Clinton caused controversy among a lot of their members. And it's because many of them actually wanted to be endorsing Bernie Sanders. Yeah, that's not surprising. Given no. the AFT's history, Bernie Sanders is like their candidate. More their, more their For speed. sure. I don't um, think I was super aware of this at the time, but I'm vaguely recalling this now. And I, I, I remember hearing about how unhappy some of the AFT membership was. Because, again, AFT historically yeah. more like very much uh, traditional labor union values and politics. Very yeah. much like the working man's organization kind of thing. And the fact that, that yeah, I guess I would just say Hillary Clinton would be way too milk toast for the rank and file aft Mm -hmm. as i understand it i would say yep yep um okay so as i was doing this research a lot of it talked about in reference what chelsea mentioned earlier which is why these two don't combine Mm -hmm. into a super union essentially it would feel Um, like it would make so much sense for them to do this Especially with how little public education is supported by the government of this country. (laughs) Okay, so these two, uh, they still talk about these two combining. No one has given up on this. (laughs) So the last real push... There's still hope. There is. was in 1998, and NEA really thought it was going to happen until it went to their own representative assembly. 
And so they would have had to have had a two thirds majority vote for that merger of NEA and AFT to take place. And they met in July of 1998 and their officers and staff and most of the press were convinced it would happen. Newspapers couldn't believe it. And they were stunned when the result was announced and only 42% of the delegates that um, had voted, or I'm sorry, they had only 42% of the delegates approval. And they needed wow. like 60%, I think is what I said, something like that, two thirds majority. Mm-hmm. So um, and I think that there was like 10,000 voters, something like that. So pretty big margin of them. And so one of the major sticking points for those delegates was that the merged union would have been affiliated with the AFL-CIO, which was against the wishes of many of the teachers. They are the ones who prefer to think of themselves, the NEA, as a professional association and not a labor union. Yeah, so the AFL-CIO being like basically a kind of organization of unions, labor right. unions. So it very much would have, in a concrete way, affiliated them with a labor organizing movement kind of mm-hmm. And as we've mentioned, the NEA, some of the membership, a lot of the membership, apparently not comfortable with that. They were like, no, no, we're a professional organization. Well, the other thing that came of that is uh, under that new structure, state affiliates would have had reduced power in favor of like locals. And that was one of the things that the AFT is like, that's how they run. And so the NEA wasn't eager to make that switch. Yeah, this is kind of making me frustrated with the NEA, actually. Yeah, it's it's pretty (laughs) frustrating. I'm definitely pro AFT in this case because I think the two of them should have found. I don't like. I do not like umbrella organization leadership people having the power when it comes to labor. Like the whole point of it is that local people, boots on the ground folks, Mm -hmm. need a voice. Yeah, and insofar as we tip the balance of power in favor of the higher ups, you're kind of. It's like a self-defeating thing to have mm. a professional organization or labor union where the people who really have the power are the higher ups. Right. Yeah, it's completely And th- th- that, that kind of situation is what leads to a lot of corruption right. and a lot of pushback against mm. unions. So, like, again, th- there's plenty of criticism that you could level at teachers unions because of stuff like that that happens where a few people get a lot of power and then things start to go down the hill so like that does happen so part of what i read though is is on both sides of if they should if they shouldn't Mm -hmm. you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like and there are obviously people on both sides because it wouldn't have ended up this way sure um a lot of people still think that it should be considered uh, based on what i've read there's no bad blood between the aft and the nea they they, they're amicable groups yeah i've heard everyone's like not really sure why they haven't combined because everyone seems to get along no they do they don't argue like they don't fight no they're not like yeah like politically even they're yeah yeah they're very pro each other they're in terms of like the national political scene they're very much aligned because they both give money into more or less and like i said everything i read literally everyone's like they're buddies yeah anyways um they're buddies but not lovers yeah truly apparently but uh, one of the things that some of these articles were suggesting is that because their memberships have declined so much over the years is that the people who have stuck around are deeply committed and hardcore and they've given the you know what i mean like if you've stuck through it when there are declining numbers and you have joined this specifically yeah or it's whatever. getting to more hardcore labor oriented right folks but, yeah it doesn't make a lot of sense to me why they haven't combined well now and it's been over 20 years since the last mm-hmm. real push i think a lot of stuff has happened obviously in education I was like, oh 98 that's only a few years ago no it's not it's like almost 25 years ago <laughs> um, i'm old but i i think that if there was a giant push and i think maybe we're looking into a time that it could be as strong yep. as ever. Yep. Um, so it would not surprise me if in the next couple of years, maybe by the next presidential election, that we don't see a greater push for them to become one. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's bad to think about it either. I, I mean, I think both of them are doing uh, some things that are worthwhile. Mm-hmm. I don't think everything from both of them should stick, but... I think if they can still be buddies, then why not? Yeah. Who's to say it could, you know, it could, it could change really. Cause neither side has said, you know, it's over. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, like I said, would not surprise me for them to, to merge to someday get, get yeah. together, get the yeah. band back together. Yeah. I think once all the weird bad blood, like that, that kind of generation of yeah. people is gone, they'll realize it. Right. maybe they will realize it's self-defeating well, i'm also i'm curious to see the politics of people coming into it if that does anything like if they both yeah. wholly agree on one candidate what that would do because i i think I'm, i don't know i'm just guessing like i said yeah. um but i think something like that could also help kind of build that you know combo i mean we're seeing the same political 
divides so like you know they're divides within the two major parties in this country and they're playing out in all kinds of different ways but uh, in the teachers union side it's the divide between the centrist left and yeah. the more you know yep. the democratic socialist kind of contingent of the bernie sanders types so th- those are the two main you know mm-hmm. actual leftists and liberals so it's happening everywhere, including in teachers' unions. Yeah. Okay. So what I ended with mm-hmm. is just a little bit about what do unions mean for teachers and school districts, like locally speaking. Yeah. Like, what does all this stuff actually um, mean? On my list, it starts with pros and cons for both, really. You know? <laughs> That's how I feel. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So what can unions do for teachers? They can help limit class size. They can help secure money. They can help limit the things that teachers are voluntold to do. Voluntold. I love that word. Um, I mean, that happens so much in education. Right. Great. You're volunteering, These, right? This is you volunteering? You you specifically are going to show up and do this thing as a volunteer, right? Um, they can hold administrators <laughs> to do what they agreed to do. And so, I, I mean, as a teacher, I'm going to have a hard time talking anti-union here. But it's only because a lot of people who criticize unions just to say that they protect the wrong people and that can happen Mm -hmm. unions can do that it's not just teachers unions that do that though for sure a lot of people argue it helps keep bad teachers did they yes do they yes but it is becoming harder and harder to do that Mm -hmm. um to keep bad teachers you know what i mean like with our evaluations and things like that it's just not the same do they still protect people that don't deserve it? Yes, of course. But unions protect people that do. And, you know, anyways, that's a whole other thing. The other thing that I mentioned is that we saw a lot of talks about these unions as schools talked about reopening last school year. So 2020, 2021 with right, COVID. With COVID, yeah. Um, these large teachers unions are who governors were forced to work with and kind of deal with directly because in our case, Columbus Public, huge district. Mike Dwine definitely has to have a, you know what I mean? Like, so a lot of people who were already anti-teacher, dare I say, are also anti-teachers union. And so they see these, um, and what I heard and what I, you know, people I know have said is like, oh, these teachers just don't want to work. So they're paying these unions to keep them out of teaching. And it's like, well, like, no, actually I want to be alive. I I would like to live to teach your child. (laughs) Um, it's hard to teach if I'm dead. So there's a little hard. A little hard. Who knew? But I did, oh, just want to throw in real quick. Like legal representation is another thing that unions do. That's pretty yes, important. It's yeah. very important. And it definitely did start to come up during COVID. Yep. We saw some spikes in that. Uh, the need for legal representation. Right. Yeah. And I mean, here in Ohio, one of the big things when they rolled out the vaccination plan was as far as figuring out who got it when. And Governor DeWine's thing was basically teachers will be vaccinated by this date. And these big schools will yeah. be back to, you know. And- it was almost on par with ho- healthcare workers, which to Dwine's credit, I, I well, I think he's screwed up a lot of things about COVID. But I do think that one of the things that he did do was allow vaccinations to happen for educators sooner than, than Well, right. Later. But he also used it as a way to dangle over their head that they had to be back yes, in person. This is true. That's the problem. This is true. Do I love that he got me mine. I'm so thankful. Way to go, Mike. <laughs> or Fran, whoever did it that day. But, um... <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it's hard because the political strings of that were truly, if we give it to teachers by this date, then they must return by this Mm -hmm. date. And that's what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Did he want us to be vaccinated? Probably. He seems kind of pro-teacher most days. I don't know about that. I I said most days. (laughs) I'm not really sure about that one. I think he thinks he is most days. Mm -hmm. How about that? Can we agree on that one? That he thinks he is pro Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but no, Dangerous. my whole point about the vaccination rollout in Ohio was that it, DeWine worked with these very, very large districts, their unions, right? These huge schools um, as a way to say, we will get you this vaccine, but you must return yeah. by this date. Yeah. Um, so that's, and that was in the news, you know, and uh, if you, especially in Ohio, <laughs> If you were watching the news for the past year, um, there was a lot of talks about the unions, not only here, but the unions all over that were keeping kids out of school. And it's like, well, was it literally keeping kids out of school? Yes. But was it saving teachers' lives? Probably. Mm -hmm. And so that's hard. And so I I think think history will be will be on the side of teachers unions in this case, because we saw saw a lot of industries like restaurant workers, like cooks, waiters, those 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 kinds of workers had the highest percentages of, of yeah, death co- yes. from COVID. 
And it, a lot of times it's because they don't have a voice like an NEA or an AFT. Right. They're not organized. So, so they don't have somebody saying, you know what, this is a very unsafe working mm-hmm. situation and maybe we should not be in it right now. Yeah. So, um, so. so my last little bit was basically the question of what doesn't give teachers bad press. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. At the end of the day, the hormone is one of the most heavily scrutinized yeah basically if you open your mouth you're in trouble um you're a teacher and my and my personal and i'm not putting this on chelsea but i think she might agree is that you know like if you think a union is a problem then you already are probably not super pro teacher like and i can tell you personally i've seen unions protect bad people so i'm not immune to that i've seen them protect people that aren't teachers that were you know so I can, I can totally understand both sides, but... Yeah, I mean, I I struggle with this because I, I too, have been in situations where I've witnessed firsthand the power of very corrupt unions. I will just say, having worked in and around the Baltimore area for a while... Oh, hey. <laughs> I've heard about that. Let's just say that there are some organizations there that are very corrupt and v- very... It's just scary. So I can see where and why... People can be skeptical about the power of labor unions yes, because they can very easily become when they accumulate a lot of power and the leadership is bad. It can very easily become a situation that is just not good for anyone. So I can understand people who are wary about that. However, and I've said this a lot of times and like, you know, I, I have very strong feelings about my own district where I grew grew up. Uh, Mm -hmm. Uh, because they're not i've had conversations with teachers there about organizing because they have not as a district t- taken on you know an, a teachers union and i understand why there's hesitancy there because of the politics of it the politics of it is nearly inescapable and for a lot of these people it's a big problem because we're in a rural area it's a very red you know part of the country it's fine whatever i get that but i just i also see these same teachers who object to the presence of a teacher's union be exploited over and over again by bad leadership at the district level. And it's just, it's really hard for me to watch that because I care about these people more than most, you know, Mm because I just, I've always thought that teachers are underappreciated, undervalued. And so it's hard for me to watch what I consider to be teachers working against their own good, because it's just like, I get what you're saying. I get why you object to these national politics, but like, also, at the same time, your local day-to-day life is very much negatively impacted by power imbalances that could be at least somewhat balanced out by the presence of a teacher's union in your district. And so it's just, yeah, to, to those who are on the, I mean, I don't even have family members who are skeptical about, you know, whether or not we should have mm-hmm. labor unions in place. In ver- and, and I get it because, like I said, I've seen how they can go wrong. It can be corrupt. But I just, I have so many friends like you. I just, I have so many friends who are dealing with the boots on the ground issues of working in conditions that are less than ideal a lot of the time a lot Mm. of the time and it just it kind of breaks my heart to watch it so so i'm going to be pro protecting those people you know whenever i can be so it's hard to it's hard to watch it happen and to feel like there's no recourse but it's a very interesting and very nuanced and very complicated political problem so sure is yeah Uh, yeah there is not one answer they they yeah. are good and bad there is no in between yeah. you know yeah. they can be both they occupy both spaces so. yeah yeah <laughs> um like everything yeah painted in many many shades of gray okay. yeah all right cool. so last episode's question anything yeah. else about unions oh no like no to? i think that's about my my i got on my soapbox there okay I'm good. happy to get off um, of it now yeah what i feel like i'm going me? to stray into no no territory anyway yeah no no territory no no right. territory fill in the blank we ready yeah Move this on? question's actually kind of hilarious now that this is what we're talking about but last episode's question <laughs> as of march 2020 what percentage of teachers leave their professions within the, the <laughs> professions leave their profession within the first five years so what percentage leave within the first five years? Yeah. Teachers? 44%. Oh my gosh. Almost half. Almost half of teachers leave teaching within the first five years. Mm-hmm. Holy cow. Yep. Okay. Are we surprised? Mm, yes and no. Okay. I mean. Are you? Oh, well, I no, am no, not no. at all. I mean, not, not. We no, make zero dollars. I'm surprised because. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm not surprised for that reason at all. I'm only surprised because like. 
most of the teachers I know go into teaching because they simply love teaching. They love kids. They love working with the just it, it's really hard because I think part of the reason the burnout and the turnover level is so high is because most teachers I know are so gung ho about their jobs, which means that when things go wrong, they go wrong more painfully than yeah. not. When you they know? go wrong, it's good. When you care that much about a thing, yeah, it's easy for that care to become. Oh my gosh, I can't yeah. psychologically just handle. The it's level hard because horribleness. Like, the people that I know have left have loved teaching, and it didn't love them back. And I don't, I don't think that too many of us would say that our job loves us back. Right. But like, we got to have you know, a get together with one of my favorite families of all time. Like one of the best things that's ever happened because of my teaching career and like having dinner with them is a moment that I'm like, this was worth it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the rest of the time I'm like, what am I doing? (laughs) Sure. So when you think about that 44%, it like checks out because you can love something that hurts you (laughs) obviously and isn't good for you. But like what I love about it outweigh, you know, it doesn't outweigh it, but it makes it, you know, it's hard to imagine not doing it because I do enjoy it so much. So yeah, if you got out, good for you. I don't blame you. (laughs) Gear nine's approaching and I'm like, "Eh." (laughs) (laughs) all right, this episode's question. I'm going to let you do this because you, Oh, I wrote like a half showed page. up. I wrote like a half a page of questions. I'm just gonna let you know as a teacher. This too is, long. The question is, is too long. Question it's a bad. It's a bad test question formatting. But really, what we I was, don't know what to focus on. No, no, no. But here's the thing. What I was trying to do here is cram in a bunch of really interesting She's facts cool. okay. about this person. I will allow you. Go ahead. Yeah. So I'm sorry the question is so long, but this woman is just badass, and okay. I had to tell me about her. her. Here. I okay. Said her so, name. That would have yeah. ruined this whole thing. Yeah, you almost did. <laughs> okay. So this woman. Again, we're looking for the name of the woman. This, Keep the, that in mind. We want to know who she who is describing. Is this lady? Yeah. What is her name? Okay. <laughs> this woman was appointed U.S. Secretary of Labor and was the first woman to be appointed to the U.S. Cabinet. Cool. After teaching science for several years, she moved to New York to study at Columbia University, where she earned a master's degree in economics and sociology in 1910. Hmm. Go Blue Lions. She served as secretary of the New York Consumers League, where she successfully lobbied the state legislature for a bill limiting the work week for women and children to 54 hours. Dear Lord. Uh, Children. Did you hear that? To 54 hours. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Mm. She was also active in the women's suffrage movement. She witnessed 146 workers, most of them young women, die in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, Mm. which was horrible go look it up oh she consistently supported the rights of workers to organize unions of their own choosing uh unions of their own choosing and to pressure employers through economic action in one famous incident this is just so cool i just threw this in here because it's so cool it was captured in a widely circulated newspaper photo she strides toward the u.s post office in homestead pennsylvania with thousands of steel workers behind okay, her this woman is awesome yes denied is there a movie about her i hope so De- denied a meeting hall by the mayor and seal executive she found an alternative site where she could inform the workers directly of their collective bargaining rights okay, overall cool. just a badass lady who so who was, was that woman yeah she was just like, like everywhere her. though she was everywhere during this time period everywhere there's anything having to do with like women's rights so suffrage cool. labor organizing she's in it showed up i, I like her never heard of this woman before and i was like holy cow I need to know. And this is what More. we should be doing. So anyway, right, cool. what's her name? What's I her like name? her. That was a long-winded way of asking, what is her name? So who was essentially the first woman, first to, be woman to be appointed to a U.S. cabinet? Yeah. To the U.S. To cabinet. the U.S. cabinet. Cool. Yep. yep. Nice job. Yeah. I'm excited. All right. You want to tell me what you learned? Oh, sure. Yeah. I learned how to make audiograms for the pod. I am glad that you did this. <laughs> my okay. my Instagram feed thanks you. Well, here's the thing. We used to make them and I made them manually with After Effects, which was a rather labor intensive process because it was just a whole thing. We had like a custom template that I yeah. made that blah, blah, blah. But we had to go and like, you know, export the audio and then import the audio. And then like Nothing match that happens the audio in a podcast the... exists in the same place. No. That's the hardest it's part. It's all over the place, too. Yeah. So anyway, we used to use this really complicated workflow for cranking out audiograms. So we stopped making them after like four episodes, I yeah. think. Audiograms long. are just cute little animations of show audio that are kind of like teaser trailers for sure. the show. So anyway, so the, the program that we use to edit our... We actually use two different programs, which is another part of the complicated thing. But we use this app called Descript, which uses 
basically ML to machine learning to analyze the recorded audio and it's transcribe pretty, it's it. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's really cool. It, tra- it like went live transcribes the audio into a script that we can then edit. Uh, it's not perfect, but it works much better than simply looking at the audio like the waveforms which is what we're well, and you for. can change out words yeah you can you can generate new audio so you so you submit a script like i read you know five pages worth of stuff i submitted that me the audio of me reading to th- this app and then they analyze it and now if there was something that we screwed up or we misquoted or whatever so you have to bleep me out for <laughs> saying what yeah. the or if we had to bleep out a large portion of audio, something like that. Anyway, the, the script would allow us to generate new audio from typed words, which we haven't used yet, but would be cool in case we can't needed to. can't believe you to. don't use that for me. No, no. You can use that. It's not necessary. Anyway, they released when a new feature. When you stop asking me to record with you, I'm going to know what's happening. It's, I'm just going to auto-generate your voice. Yeah. Uh, anyway, they released a new feature somewhat recently that allows you to generate audiograms from... So you just select again it, it's a generated script you just select the words that you want to turn into the audiogram and you export it and then it auto generates this cute little audiogram so you're probably going to be seeing cute. those on our on our feed i'm at excited some point, our these. social feeds That'd yeah be nice what'd you learn i saw a tweet that said that crows understand the concept of zero <laughs> crows like the birds yep they understand the mathematical like the concept raven. of zero nevermore yep uh, yeah but not but not that Did it's not... a different bird yeah whoa really crows and ravens are different y- yeah yeah they are oh i thought they were the same thing no they're not the same thing they're just big ugly blackbirds in my head they so. are both big ugly blackbirds anyways yes. well that's also something i learned <laughs> um okay so the tweet was just about how crows understand the concept of zero and everything on twitter everyone on twitter was like what do i do with this information <laughs> <laughs> which i sort of agree with like i don't need to know the crows are that much smarter than i am you know um yeah also the last thing i want to plug just as like a little feel good at the end of this episode we recently watched and finished immediately ted lasso which is a show on, oh we have a new episode to watch by the way on apple a new TV. one came out yeah yeah what mm-hmm. comes out weekly now mm-hmm. um so we watched season one um it's about soccer it's about soccer, but in a way that you need to know nothing about soccer. Oh, yeah. You don't have great. to know. He doesn't know anything about he, soccer. Well, yeah, so don't you do don't much, have to Don't know. do too much. But okay. yes. Yeah. Um, Jason Sudeikis. Uh-huh. Is that him? Uh-huh. Is he the one that was married to Amy Poehler? No, that's the Lego man. Will. Yeah, that's Will Arnett. Will Arnett. Okay, anyways. <laughs> Ted Lasso. We watched Ted Lasso. It's an adorable show on um, Apple TV. Jason Sudeikis is great. It's got a great cast. And it was just like, again, we're, we're all still trying to find some peace and happiness in the world because things are still not, you know, as easy not as a they hundo. could be. But Ted Lasso is a beautiful, bright spot. It's um, just super cute and feel it, good. It's just fun. Like he's the uh, part of the premise of the story is that he's he's just an undefeatable optimist. Right. He's extremely optimistic. And about normally everything. I find those people horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but I love him. It's so cute. My cynical, pessimistic co-host here is like, I okay. hate no, no, no. people. I like people who can see like on the bright side, but his is like almost. Anyways, I, anyway, it's just, it was a great show. We really liked it. It's really very fun. Very, very fun. fun. Very wholesome. Um, wholesome. And I would just recommend it as like a nice, you know what I mean? Like just a feel good show, mm-hmm. which we all still need. Mm-hmm. Chelsea and I go back and forth between like the severity of the TV we're watching. Yeah. And so we Apple were looking TV, for something a Apple little TV bit lighter. Winning me over. I didn't think I would ever be a pro Apple product, but yeah. Apple TV, the shows that they are producing. I feel You're the not same pro way about, Apple product. Not in general. What are you reading off of? Uh, what are you on all day? <laughs> That's not my choice exactly. But anyway, what's it like up there? <laughs> Can you see or hear the rest I of us? I don't like that they're a walled garden. Okay. I just don't like that. But can you even hear me down here from your high castle? Hello. Hello. I didn't expect myself to be pro Apple in any regard, but I was, I've was. i been pleasantly surprised by the Everything quality. Everything we've watched on Apple TV has yeah. been a banger. Apple truly. TV has been great. Uh, for all mankind. We mentioned that a couple episodes <sighs> ago. Extraordinary. And then good we TV. immediately, after Ted Lasso, because we had to become immediately depressed again, we started the morning show, the morning show, which is Jennifer Aniston, Reese Witherspoon, who are two of my favorite actresses. 
And I again, I won't give very much away either. But um, and what's his face? Um, Steve Carell. Yeah, Steve Carell. Yeah. Great show, mm-hmm. very heavy. So there are some trigger warnings. Also, I still want to ruin it's it. It's basically Matt Lauer fictionalized. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's very well written. So, mm-hmm. anyways, Apple TV for the win. Ted Lasso, big W. Oh, just yeah. so fun. Um, so if you're looking for something just to enjoy that's not super heavy, can I recommend a podcast? Mm-hmm. Can we do that here? I've been listening to a podcast called Stuff the British Stole, mm. which I originally heard an episode on 99% Invisible with Roman Mars. Uh huh. So I guess I'm, rep- I'm recommending too, but we've talked about Roman Mars before. Yeah. It, we are we firm, like 99 PI. We are firm Roman Mars fans Big here. Fans. But he did an episode with the creator of Stuff the British Stole as like a, you know, they did one episode and then they talked and whatever. Mm-hmm. And so we were driving, of course, because that's all we've done this summer. And stuff the British Stole came up and I was like, this is interesting. So I went to that podcast. It's a great podcast. I am learning so much. It's about artifacts, about, like, imperial, Like, yeah. it is so well done. Artifacts kind of stolen from other countries and imported. Oh, not kind of. Uh, looted. Artifacts? No, it's okay, looted. Let me rephrase. Artifacts looted from other countries and imported into yeah. British museums, basically. But it's... It's like I like history. It's not super history heavy. It's like very digestible. Uh, you can go into it knowing nothing, which I did. But it's been really fun to listen to while I'm in the yard. I've learned a lot. Cool. I listened to a whole episode about Pekingese today. Um, so that's a really great podcast if you're just looking for like six episodes that are pretty fascinating. Neat. Um, and it's Roman Mars endorsed, which is all anyone needs in the world. So <laughs> if Roman Mars likes it, we like it. We stand it hard. Mm-hmm. So two weeks from now. The women will have won gold. And I think that's Fingers all I Fingers and toes crossed. Yep. <laughs> Everyone. Anything else? Everyone throw some good juju out into the world for the U.S. soccer team. The women's soccer team. We'll see you in two weeks. Yeah. We'll see you then. See ya. Bye. Thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at 16to1.com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. (laughs) Cheeks.